chosen foolishness of preaching to save people that believe, and yet God, we often don't embrace the foolishness. We're scared, we're intimidated. God, release us from that, protect us from that. God, shine your light in this place. May this corner be a beacon where the gospel is preached and people are called to faith and repentance. Souls are saved, God. Regenerated, born again, life. The rivers of living water just flowing from this place, God. Just make this life. Now, Lord, as we get in the word, just a little while, would you help us to see the sovereign king? Who he is? Jesus. Well, we're going to divert from Romans a little bit for the next couple of weeks. Mark. Look at Mark. Chapter 11. Or I could send a chair away and stay up to you. That would be good. <laughs> you, mind, you mind if I interject before you get going? I just have a passage that, that I can't do all this over and over in there. Um, it's from 2 Kings. Um, Elisha is a prophet in uh, Israel at that time, and uh, the the king of Aram has come and, and uh, has surrounded Jerusalem, if I remember right. And uh, in Second Kings six, let me find that exact part I'm looking for. Well, just get the, get the picture in your mind that, that Jerusalem is surrounded and like there's this big army there, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, then in in, uh, in verse, um, I'll start in verse 13. So the king said, go and see where he is so I can send him captured. When he was told, Elisha is in Dothan, he sent horses, chariots, and a massive army there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early and went out, he discovered an army with horses and chariots surrounding the city. So he asked Elisha, Oh, my master, what are we to do? We're, we're surrounded. The army's come for us. Elisha said, Don't be afraid, for those who are with us outnum outnumber those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, please open his eyes and let him see. So the Lord opened the servant's eyes. He looked and saw that the mountain was covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I just I don't know why, but like I said, as we were worshiping, this this passage just came to me. I know that we're kind of a small group, and sometimes it seems like you know how can we really have an impact here in Israel? You know, and, and I don't know if you guys feel that way, but sometimes it we're there's not a lot of us. We're not. We're not a big army. We're not, you know, and and uh, but but we're only a small part of this huge army. Like God's got legions and legions. It doesn't matter that there's not a ton of us. It's, it's up to God, and, and He's the one that's going to be fighting. He's the one that's going to be um, bringing people salvation. So, so remind us of that. That's right. God has to say salvation is the one. God is wanting to save. <laughs> Alright, Mark chapter 11. for <laughs> No, she stays away from this prayer. She actually prays like, uh, God, would you just give me some peace or wine? Would you give me what I want? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to start here and uh, draw some um, draw some uh, points out from uh, Mark over the next several chapters. Actually, uh, I, I, I noticed something that Mark might have been doing, or at least what the text does as I read it, um, uh, looking at Jesus. And, and here's the basic thought that I want to drive us. That Jesus is a sovereign king. And he's sovereign over everything. 
And that one thought, as you meditate on that, my hope this morning is that you meditate on the sovereignty of, of Jesus. It should give you great peace. I don't have peace when I'm not thinking about Jesus in control. And I look at here in Mark, in Mark 11 where Jesus begins to, to come in. He's, he's entering on a donkey. And, and right from the beginning, he's sovereign over, uh, over the most minuscule of details. Where to get a donkey? You see it. He, his creation is his. And he can ask for it and do with it whenever and whatever he wants. And you see Mark just, well, the events that Mark is sharing is just displaying his sovereignty over every aspect. And even when it seems like men are in control, men are winning, they're killing Jesus, it's clear that Jesus is the sovereign one in control through the whole thing. And so over the next couple of weeks, um, uh, we'll see how far we get today because I want to really deal with the, what does it mean for Jesus to be the son of David, um, the, the sovereign king, son of David. What does that mean when we hit that here in the week in the beginning? But I just pray that the sovereignty of Jesus, as, as we see it in the, in the Eastern narrative, um, will just encourage you and strengthen you. I need it today. So, All right, chapter 11, verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage, to Bethany, and the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and I will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found the colt tied to a, uh, at a door outside of the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said, hey, what are you doing? Tying the colt. And they told them Jesus had need of it, and they let it go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread the cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches uh, they had, uh, that they had cut from the fields. Those who went before and those who followed after were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. That's a key phrase I want to focus on this morning. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, it was, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany. Um, I want you to get the picture of what's going on here. Jesus is, is, is riding into town as a king, but it's an odd sort of king because he's not riding on a stallion, he's not riding in a chariot, he's not being pulled by this big army, he's not being led around, he's not, it doesn't, he's just a guy sitting on a donkey with a bunch of fishermen around him. And they're throwing clothes on the ground rather than rose petals. And, and, and just, it's, it's an odd, very poor looking picture here. But I imagine Israel, and as he's riding in Jerusalem, you know, people are watching this and saying, I mean, they're thinking in their mind, He's here. Our king is here. I don't really care what he's looking like as long as he's going to be set up and do what God promised would happen. Now, in order to help you understand what was going on in their minds, we need to go back um, and see in the Old Testament scriptures what is it that Jerusalem was looking for? What were they, what were they looking for? What were they saying when they said, Verse 10, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Why do they call Jesus the son of David? Go to, let's start in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Now, you can see what Matthew, what Matthew does in his, in his narrative. Matthew 1.1. One, one. It's in the New Testament. The very first verse of the New Testament. Oh, Dan, funny. 
The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ was the next phrase. Son of David. Why is that significant to Matthew? Then he says, not only the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then it goes about, and you say, why does Matthew spend all this time? So and so begat so and so, they got so and so begat so and so begat so and so begat so and so. Because Matthew is proving this is the son of David we've been waiting for. Here's here's Jesus' lineage. Here's how he's related to David. This is the branch of David we've been waiting for. For a Jewish mind, they were excited about that. Matthew's Matthew's primary audience are, are Jewish people. He's looking to convince a Jewish mind that Jesus is indeed the Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David we've been waiting for. The son of Abraham, by whom all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. The son of David, who will set up his kingdom, and from his kingdom he will have an eternal throne. There will be happiness and glory forever and ever. That's what they're looking for. They're waiting for God to fulfill his promise. And so this is an exciting thing. So when, when Jesus was riding in on a donkey and people were singing Hosanna in the highest, I imagine not everyone was singing Hosanna. I imagine... To be honest with you, I don't know how it went down, but I imagine the disciples were singing it first. And then people hear this, Hosanna. Blessed is the son of David. Son of David, he's here. That's him. I. And they grab limbs and trees. And they, I mean, I don't think this was a staged event. I don't think this, I mean, I think this was a very spontaneous. People start hearing Hosanna, the son of David's here. And then now they're going out and like, he's here. And everybody's excited. But the problem is you see the story turn because that, when he comes, what does he do? He doesn't set up his kingdom. He doesn't go to Herod. He doesn't go to Pilate. He doesn't go take down and dethrone Caesar. He goes to the temple. That's his next step. He goes to the temple and throws out the religious, uh, throws out the money changers. And, and, he, and he, then he begins teaching against uh, the religious teachers who were, you know, of, of the day. And, and you see... Jesus is establishing his sovereignty and, and, his, and his throne is the son of David, and yet uh, it's not what the people were looking for. It's not. The, but what were they looking for? So that's the question we need to ask first of all. What were they looking for? Anybody have a question? Everybody know where we're headed so far? Uh, respond. I'm preaching a little bit this morning. Let's go to, uh, we need to go to Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and see what exactly were they looking for. Now, I want to say this. You say, what does this got to do with me? Let me just help you right now. What the Jews were looking for is what you need to be looking for and, and getting excited about. Because Jesus actually came and did what Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah prophesied that God was going to do. If Jesus came and did that already and has promised to finish it off when he returns We've got a lot to be excited about. The problem is the Jews were excited about the wrong things because they misunderstood. They didn't understand what to be excited about. So let's go to Ezekiel 37. We'll start there. I wish I were a better teacher to get you excited about this truth that I'm teaching you, but try not to let boredom set in. <laughs> this is a very good theological lesson here, but uh, what? Ezekiel 37. Uh, I, I want to read for you verses 1 through 14, and then the focus. The verses that we're going to get to are going to be verses 24 and 25. So I'm going to read the whole chapter. Am I ready? Mm -hmm. The rest of the people were excited about the Jews. They were excited about the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out uh, by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley that was full of bones. And he led, led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. Behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, God, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the word, uh, the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you. Uh, I think that's cartilage, by the way. And I will cause flesh to come upon you. 
and I'll cover you with skin, and I'll put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I'm the Lord your God. I want you to see this, this pattern here. When I put breath in you, you're going to live, and you're going to know that I'm God. That's the result. So to live in this text means you know God's God. And when you know he's God, what do you do? You worship him and you keep his statutes and judgments. Watch what he says. No, this is this is a, this is kind of a parable, but that it, it was a vision that Ezekiel saw that God showed him. So I prophesied as I was commanded. I preached to the bones as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound. And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, speak to the breath, speak, son of man. Say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O, o breathe, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. So if these bones were the house of Israel, what does that mean about Israel before the breath of life came into them? They were dead. House of Israel had no hope. It was a it was just nothing but a, a place full of dry bones. It was there was no life, no spirituality, no connection with God at all. What? Um, I don't know. Thank you. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost and we are indeed cut off. That's what it means to be dry and dead bones in this, in this text. What do we know about Israel? What happened? Huh? They were cut off. Isaiah preached and prophesied until the land was a desolation. Then the land became a desolation in the in the uh, Babylonian captivity, and they're dead. It's dead. It seems like Israel's dead now. There is no God's people anymore. There is no group. There is no place. There is no people of God anymore. It seems they're dead, and there's no hope. And we're indeed cut off. What's his answer? Prophesy and say to them. Thus says the Lord God: Behold, I will open your graves and raise raise you from your graves, O my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. See that connection? When I bring you into the land, what are you going to know? I'm going to know that I'm the Lord your God. What, the way God does things and the reason he does things is so that we know he's God. That principle is still in play today, God. God is working in your life in such a way. Uh, you know, he, he takes, he takes a, a dead situation in your life and brings you to life in it just so that you can know he's God. And that's the way he's doing salvation. He's working in your life so that at the end of the day, at the end of it, when you die and breathe your last breath, you know that he's God because your last breath is your first breath of eternity. And you'll know that he's God because he's going to bring you into the land. And you will know. When he, when he finishes the salvation work, when you, see, I, I think this is somewhat of a parable for us now. We have the so, uh, so-called uh, sinews and flesh, and we're, we're up and talking, but there's no breath of life in us, so to speak, because the resurrection nearly hasn't happened. We haven't been given these, uh, the, the, brand, the brand new bodies, so to speak. But on that day when God brings us into the land, by the way, this isn't Jerusalem. That's what people read this and say, God is going to, you know, there's going to be a, this mass, you know, God's going to bring people back to Jerusalem. That's not what this text is going to talk about because I'm going to show you in the next phrase uh, why that is. Uh, this is all about eternal, eternity. The, bringing you into the land, knowing that you're God, putting my spirit within you, that is all um, eternal uh, heaven, second, new heavens, new earth, and eternal state language. Uh, I don't have time to back that up except down the road here in a minute. So keep that in mind. Keep, where, where is it? Verse 12, there it is. And I will bring you to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I'm the Lord your God when I open your graves. And I raise you from your graves, O my people. And I'll put my spirit within you and you shall live. And I'll place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I'm the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. So the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, take a stick and write on it. For Judah and the people of Israel associated with them, then take another stick and write on it. Uh, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and, and the house of Israel associated with him. And join them one to another into one stick, 
they may become one in your hand. And when your people say to you, will you not tell us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I'm about to take the stick of Joseph, Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel associated with him, and I will join with the stick of Judah and make them one stick, that they may be one in my hand. God's going to take two peoples that are separated and distinct and make them one. I wonder what God's doing in salvation history like that. What's God doing? There's two groups of people, aren't there? Who are the two people? Jews and Gentiles. And he's going to take, I, I believe, that in this text, he's speaking eternally and he's speaking, while he's speaking in a, in a what, how do we say, in a temporal, in a real historical setting, he's got eternal things in mind, because look where he goes. When the sticks on which you write in your hand before their, their eyes, he'd say to them, this is verse 21, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the people of Israel from the nations among which they have gone, and I will gather them from all around and bring, bring them to their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. And they shall be no longer two nations and no longer divided into two kingdoms. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols and their detestable things or with any of um, any of their transgressions. But I will save them from all of their backslidings and in which they have all sinned. And I will cleanse them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. My servant David shall be king over them. Now, you, you see, if, if you take this text to mean a very temporal thing that, that uh, God has in mind a very, um, uh, 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 when I say temporal, I mean historical Israel, he's got that in mind here, then why is he now speaking of who? My son of David who will rule over them. And, and what is going to be the nature of these people? They're not going to sin anymore. They're not going to go after idols anymore. They're going to have one God. They're not going to be like the rebellious people. In other words, God is going to finish what he started in history. And what did he want out of man? What was the one thing God wanted? I want to be God. <laughs> he, he started with Adam. Adam, I'm God. Obey me. Adam said, no, I'm God. I want to be like God. I'm disobeying. That's the nature of that sin. And so from the very get-go, uh, from the very beginning, God made a people over which he might be God. They might be his people, and there might be mutual joy forever. God gets joy in the glory he gets, and we get joy glorying in him. As I was talking to Steve yesterday, it's a win-win. Uh, when, you, when you talk about something you love, is there joy in it? Absolutely. In fact, the joy comes in talking about it. That's glory, by the way. And so when you talk about the God you love and when you give him praise because you love him, that's glory. It's joy for you. It's no burden for you at all. But God's got this uh, group of people now that he is now building up for himself who won't defile themselves, verse 23, anymore with their idols and their detestable things with any other, uh, or with any of their transgressions. What's that mean? They're not going to defile themselves with any transgressions anymore. They're going to be per They're not going to rebel against me anymore. When does that happen? Has that happened in Israel yet? That hasn't happened. My servant David shall be king over the twenty-four, and they shall all have one shepherd. And they shall walk in my rules and be careful to obey my statutes. And they shall dwell in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, where your fathers lived. They and their children and their children's children shall dwell there how long? Forever. Forever. This is an eternal dwelling place, isn't it? And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. Is this text talking about nation Israel at one point in time? No, it's not. But yet, was Israel divided at one time? Absolutely. Did he make the kingdom uh, two kingdoms one? Absolutely. This has a, a temporal meaning. Uh, Ezekiel took uh, contemporary concepts, or God took co contemporary truths and gave them eternal meanings. So that's this is what we call typology and, 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 or or prophecy. Ezekiel is prophesying. It has a near fulfillment, and, but really that near fulfillment is just a picture or a shadow of what. The future fulfillment. And, and somebody said it like this. 
You ever seen a mountain range and seen one mountain and then the next mountain behind it? But you know between those mountains, there's all, all kinds of space and time, uh, you know, space, isn't it? But uh, the prophets could only see the two mountains. They, they didn't know all the details in the middle. You know, does that make sense? And often there's a near fulfillment to what Ezekiel was saying. There was a near fulfillment, except they never had servant David, never came and took his place on the throne. But notice that God, is, what is God telling Israel? There's going to be a day. He's telling them in the middle of their captivity, there's going to be a day where you're going to be in the land again. You're going to be my people. You're not going to go after nations anymore. You're not going to go after idols anymore. And you're going to have a king, and you're going to be united, and I'm going to be there forever. It's going to be a great blessing. It's going to be an awesome time. And if you're a, a people under captivity, under persecution by a, a captor, it's a wonderful thought to think, i got a king, God. Uh, it's going to set up a king. There's going to be a king one day. So I'm not going to be captive under anymore. He's going to be my shepherd. He's going to be my king. So you're starting to get this. And, and notice what's going to be the state. Look at verse 27. I, I didn't read it yet. My dwelling place shall be with them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. And then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel. When my sanctuary is in their midst. Okay. You see why it's confusing, though? Because he keeps naming Israel. He keeps saying Israel. It seems to exclude us, but what does Paul help us in Romans? You are Israel. We're not. The church doesn't replace Israel. You've been, what's that? Grafted. You've been grafted in, he says in Romans, uh, what was it, Romans 11. You've been, you, you are a different branch, but you've been added to the branch. So everything that God promised, this future kingdom of Israel, guess what? Who's that a promise to it for? That's for us. Are y'all following this? Any questions about what we said so far? This, so they had this scripture. Oh, yes. They were looking for a Davidic king, a son of David, my servant David. They didn't think it was going to be real David to come back to life. They, they just understood that this was going to be, well, what he says. Um, let's go to Jeremiah 23, for instance. There's also something that's what you just heard. I mean, the ten tribes that were known as Israel were like completely destroyed. I mean, it's like completely scattered. And it's the same. I'm going to draw you back from among all the nations. But they didn't take that. Jeremiah 23. This is another scripture that they would have in his relationship to Ezekiel 37. It's just, just a, uh, no, go the other way. A couple of pages. Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah, first chapter 23. Now, they got an Emily. God was telling, God said these things so many, many hundreds of years before Jesus ever came. He was telling us about who Jesus would be. Jeremiah 23. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You scattered my flock, and you've driven them away. You have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you and your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will, get, after I deal with you, I'm going to gather the remnant of my flock. You've scattered them, but there's going to be a remnant left over. You're going to gather, I'm going to gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them. And I will bring them back to their fold. And here's God bringing them back out of captivity again. I wonder, is that designed to be, you know, to shadow something? What are we, are we in captivity? Are we scattered? We're scattered about this earth, and what are we in captivity to? Death, sin, that's right. God is bringing us out of that captivity, bringing us where? Unto himself. We've gone in rebellion. We, and that's, what, and that's why, the, why, did the, why the captivity happen. Years, years. How many years did Jeremiah preach? In chapter 25, he says, for 23 years. Jeremiah 25. He says, for 23 years, verse 3. 
from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, to this day, the word of the Lord has come to me, and, you, and I've spoken persistently to you, and you haven't listened. So here you have a rebellious people, and that's who God's coming to. But he doesn't cast off the rebellious people. He draws a, uh, a remnant that he has separated out of himself, back to himself. So is he uh, just simply addressing here the shepherds in that day? Correct. But... But God has an eternal meaning with this prophecy. So it wouldn't be a stretch to say that he's addressing people who mishandle the word of God. Absolutely. Absolutely. I take this this is a this text helps me be a good pastor. Because the, the bad things that these that these shepherds did, I should do the opposite of as the shepherd, so to speak. Look what he says in verse 4. I will gather, I will set shepherds over them who will care for them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming. So, so he's got a very, very uh, present tense application to Jeremiah's day. But, but look, what, look at the, very, the shift right away. Behold, the days are coming declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. You see, you see, here's a prophecy of Jeremiah. What's God saying? There's, there's a branch of David out there. What's that mean, a branch of David? Yeah. A descendant, you know, in his, in his family tree, you know. He's a branch. <laughs> You're sitting in the seat of honor. <laughs> you the seat of slack. Like a black eye. <laughs> or that was verse 5. Okay. So, so here's another one of, of several passages of Scripture where, um, where God is promising this branch of David to come and set himself up as what? As a sovereign king. But, but look at what kind of king he's going to be. This is a king. Remember it now. Keep in mind. What are the what are the people in Israel when Jesus is coming into town? Hosanna, the God in the highest, who finally sent the Son of David that we've been waiting for. What kind of Son of David have we been waiting for? This Son of David, who is going to do what? He's going to reign wisely and justly and righteously. And he's going to deal with the injustices that we've been living under, under Caesar. That's the context of which they're... That's the way they're reading this. They're looking for a king, this descendant of David, who's going to come up and set up his throne. Why do you think Herod was talking about it? Herod, the one who killed all... Why, why do you think he wanted to kill all the babies? This is God, this, this righteous branch is going to be a, affect my throne. Again, the people of Israel have, have, have read this, and they're looking temporally. They didn't understand in Jesus, all the mysteries of God are revealed. All the treasures of the knowledge of God are revealed in Jesus. In other words, Jesus is the answer to this. And so when you see it fulfilled in Jesus, you can go back and understand this text now. We have the ability to look back through the filter of Jesus and his death on the cross and understand this text, whereas Israel did It was dark to them. It was a mystery to them. But, and so even Paul, like the epitome of Jews didn't see this until right. it was hidden road. from them. Yeah. It was hidden. So it wasn't like they didn't study the Bible hard Correct. This was God's plan. That's right. And and you get that uh, there's there's a piece I want to get to verse six. So hold your place there. We go to Matthew thirteen for, for a minute. God has been revealing his plan since day one, hasn't he? Look in the garden. Did, did he not reveal the plan? He's going to squash the squash, but who is going to do it? The offspring. A son. There's going to be a son of the woman that's going to come. And, so they've been, since Abraham and before that, they've been waiting for a son, to, a son to come deal with Satan. Now, Matthew 13, I, I, I've taken you this before, but you get this picture. God is revealing truth, but he's doing it in key. Why did Jesus speak parables? Matthew 13 gives the answer. Read it for us, Andrew. Um, verse 
Um, start, uh, yeah, start, um, start verse 9 and read on to like 17. He who has ears, let him hear. The disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he shall have an abundance. For whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore, speak, therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn again, and I should heal them. The blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I say to you, that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So here's Jesus telling them, he's, what, he just got finished teaching them the parable of the seed. He's got the seed, you know, that's rocky and like wayside, thorny, good ground. And he's teaching biblical, he's teaching uh, kingdom principles, isn't he? But, but what's he really doing? He's teaching kingdom principles by hiding the kingdom principles from those who will hide the problem. So in seeing and hearing, they won't see and hear. In other words, God is revealing truth here, isn't he? But he's keeping it hidden. And he reveals it to, to whoever he wants. And he says, Blessed are your ears and blessed are your eyes because they see and hear. In other words, if you see and understand the kingdom principles that are being taught here, guess what? You're blessed. Notice what he says. It has not been given to them. Where is, where is it? Verse 11. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom, but it has not been given to them. It's a massive statement. In other words, if you're going to understand the mysteries of the kingdom, guess what? It's, been given to you. it's got to be given to you. That is in the Bible. Jesus says in John 6, John 8, John 10, John 6, three times, no man comes to the Father unless it's he's drawn. No man comes to the Father unless it's granted to him. It's an amazing thing. Everybody get it? So, verse 6 of Jeremiah 23. In, in his days, Judah will be saved. In whose days? <coughs> yes, in, in the days yeah, in the days of the son of David. Judah is going to be saved. Now, now, wait a minute. Now, who did Jesus come to save? Not just the Jews only, but also the Greeks. So, when he speaks of Judah, what do you mean? Is only Israel going to be saved? No, we understand that there's a there's an Israel of, of birth, and then there's a true Israel, right? Israel that has been grafted in, an Israel that's in Jesus. Ah, we, we get home. God calls His people Israel, my son. So guess what? If you love Jesus. And you've been born of Jesus. You are Israel. You've been brought in to be in his fold. And verse 7 says, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, As the Lord lives who brought up the people out of it, uh, the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. They won't say that anymore. They won't remember that anymore. What are they going to say? But they're going to say, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led us, led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of the and out of all the countries where he had driven them, then they shall dwell in their own land. I, you know, I look at that though. I, you know, up until the what did Jesus do at the Last Supper? <coughs> what did he do at the Last Supper? He took the Passover meal. What did he do with it? He gave it new meaning. What are they remembering now? It really showed what it was, what it always was foreshadowing all along. Right. But but no no longer are you now remembering this Exodus event. What are you now remembering? 
the body and blood that was given for you to bring you out of captivity and sin. So here you have maybe an allusion to that concept, this change in uh, the, the worship of, uh, of God through this Davidic king. With that being said, here's, here's the awesome thing. Notice what we get with Jesus. When Jesus is entering in. You know what he's saying? He was indeed saying, I'm the son of David. I'm the one that's promised. But so so he was confirming. They were right to say that, except they were wrong to say, oh, we messed up, and then killed him instead. Crucify him, because the, the same crowd was screaming, crucify him days later. Right? They were right to cry, Hosanna, son of David. But when they didn't get what they were hoping for, they were like, well, this ain't the one we want. Because their eyes were on the temple. And so some of the lessons we can learn from this are many people have a concept of Jesus as, well, I want Jesus as long as he satisfies the needs that I perceive that I have right now. I'm not living in happiness. And this is why the prosperity gospel is so bad. Because basically, uh, let me tell you, if, somebody, if Jesus went in preaching a prosperity message to the people of Israel, they would have flocked to him. They would not have run from him. They would have not have rejected him. They would have not have the stone that the builders rejected. He's become the cornerstone. Yeah, he made him prosperous for a day, and he gave him a taste of the prosperity that was to come. And uh, so, so we have to make sure that we're not living in happiness. So we have to make sure that the message of Jesus that we preach has what kind of a focus? A temporal focus or an eternal focus? This is why I preach and teach like I do. One of the reasons. Because when God, when God's working in the temporal circumstances, what does he really have in mind? What's he really working for? Eternal. Okay, God always has the eternal in mind. But he works in the temporal to bring about the eternal. Y'all follow that principle? You can almost say all of this because it's one big parable and it's a couple of parables and it's a story of the family meaning. Sure. It, it's all been working out for God's eternal purposes. God's been ordering history and planning and ordaining and decree. This is why, this is one of the, the things that I'm seeing that, that here's Jesus coming in as the sovereign king of David that God has promised to set up. The problem is they didn't understand what the sovereign king was here to do. He came to save his people from their sins, not save his people from a tyrant called Caesar. Yes, that's right. But they didn't want to be saved from their sins. They weren't sins weren't the problem in their mind. Um, so that's that's one small lesson we can see. Um, an, another lesson here is and this is what I wanted to end on and focus on. Do you see what we, at least in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel, do you see what we get? There's going to be a day, y'all, when Jesus come, Jesus came and did. He procured his spot at the right hand of the Father. How did he do it? God, 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 God. That's right. What, somebody quote Philippians 2, uh, 5 and on. Jesus didn't count himself to be, count his equality with the Father. Jesus belonged to the Lord. I, 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 just I give us the gist. He became a humble, he humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God will highly exalt him and gave, give him the name of uh, every name so that, the knee, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. So this triumphal entry wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't the road uh, to, the, to the throne in Jerusalem. It was the the road to the throne of New Jerusalem. It was the first step along the, the road of uh, the road of Calvary. This is a big deal. I always like what he says because it says that the teacher told Jesus, rebuke your disciples, and the rest said, they don't say this through the rocks and bread. Yeah. Because that hit the floor. Yeah. That's a great I love that one. And that that for us, if we don't proclaim his glories. Others will proclaim him. Not doing a bad thing, even if you die doing it. 
even if you're hated for doing it, it's okay. Because this this present tense ain't what God's doing. <laughs> we just have to live through this present tense and make it through. And there's all kind Israel went through all kinds of pain, didn't they? They went through the pain of a of a Caesar. God ordained that. They went through a pain of dispersion, and, 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 and God ordained that. Jesus went through the pain of death, and God ordained that. But what's all this is working to bring about God's eternal kingdom. And that's the beauty. It's an eternal kingdom. It's in a kingdom that won't die. We get that. We get a king who's going to deal justly and righteously. He's going to execute justice and righteousness. That means every wrong will be righted. He'll be king. You'll love him as your king. You'll get that. We won't have an ungodly president. We won't have anybody ruling over us that we don't want ruling over us. In his days, Judah will be saved. Jesus, this is Jeremiah 23, 6, Jesus came to save. That's what he came to do. And he's still in the business of saving people. And he's calling the people for his name's sake who might be in his kingdom. So when you pray, thy kingdom come, does this help you? This nuances of what we're praying. What are we? God, this kingdom, this kingdom of David that you said was coming, I'm ready for that now. Jesus came and procured a spot. He's just waiting until the day that his enemies will become his footstool. Whatever it is. His father says, all right, son, it's time. You, you mentioned suffering, even, even if it means suffering and dying. You, something interesting that comes to mind when I think about Jesus speaking in parables and, and you know, just looking at the reaction of, of the Israelites when, when Jesus came. It's, you're going to be misunderstood, too. And God has ordained that. Like, if you're going to preach the gospel and people aren't going to understand, you're going to be misunderstood. Which, I don't know, for me, sometimes that, that's hard. Like, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them the truth and they're not going to get it. Like, no matter how well they teach it, they're not going to get it. But, but some are. For those who have been granted, they're going to get it. And they're going to want the same kingdom. That's why you have to absolve yourself of, you know, be faithful, speak a word, speak it freely, and really trust God with the results. I mean, you just have to release that into his hand because you could have said it all wrong, you could have said it all right, and the results are going to be what he designs. So, I mean, that's what I just keep going back to that, you know. I can't, I can't do God's work. The, the, that part that where you know it's miracle enough in that uh, Ezekiel passage that he takes those dry bones and he makes them up and roaming around that's miracle enough the fact that we're here in the flesh is miracle enough but then to put a spirit within us I don't know I just he said he's going to empower his word speak it and let him do it and you notice, and maybe that's a good place to, to end, you notice that that is how God brings people into the kingdom. He gives dead men life. We prophesy to them. We speak to them. The words of life. God gives them life. It's an awesome text. I, I hope that gives you some insight and some understanding as to what Israel is looking for. But what I also hope it does is that this is what you should be looking for. But look for the proper thing. Don't look for something, something else. Look for the Jesus who calls to come and die. But to have eternal life. So uh, kind of maybe next week we're going to go through the rest of Mark. And you're going to just kind of walk with me real quick. Look, look at the very first thing he does. He curses a fig tree. What's that? He's, he's, he's establishing his authority, his kingship over what? Over the natural order. Over, I mean, he's displaying, 
I have the power to do anything I want. I can say to this fig tree, you're not going to bear any more fruit anymore. And then, and then he goes into the temple and he throws out the money changers. He's establishing his authority over God's house, over, over the church, over, over the, uh, what, what God says it should be a house of prayer. He uh, then begins to uh, go to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And uh, in chapter 12, he, he speaks this parable that just absolutely destroys the Pharisees. I mean, they, they knew at the end of the day that, fair, that parable was all about them. And they wanted to kill him. In fact, verse 12 says, And they were seeking to arrest him. But feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. But what's Jesus doing? Jesus is going to the authorities, the, the God authorities, and saying, you, You're no authority, and you're just murderers. And he's establishing his kingship there. Um, the Sadducees are next, they come to him. Um, and you see the scribes in chapter, the end of chapter 12. Then you see in chapter 13, this is the sermon, uh, this is the uh, the Olivet Discourse, I believe, uh, if, that's where, if that's where it's called, I believe it is, um, where Jesus begins uh, telling about the order of events that are going to happen before he returns. He's establishing his authority over of all of history. He knows every detail that's going to happen. He's ordaining it, controlling it. And then you see him go stand before uh, down the road, you see him go um, stand before Pilate, stand, you know, and all these things. You just see Mark telling the story and showing Jesus is the king. He's in control. He's the authoritative one. And that ought to give us great power and hope for our own lives because we serve the guy that's in charge. We're not on the wrong side, though it feels like it sometimes. We feel like we're going against the grain. You ever get tired of swimming against the current? <laughs> Yeah, it's tiring, but don't worry. Even if you drown doing it, you're, uh, you got a sovereign king that's in control. So, uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll go through Mark's account of this uh, Easter narrative and see some truths there. Any other things that, for the benefit of the group? Thoughts you've had? Do you have any questions about the historical connection between the prophecies about Israel and coming into the land and how they relate to Jesus? And this is why I don't hold it. <laughs> by the way, those are the texts, by the way, that, that the people who say, you know, the friends of Israel, that's why they're friends of Israel, because they're waiting for God to really do that still. That, that's the problem with the thing. Jesus, God's already done it. He, he just hasn't culminated it yet in his return. But Jesus came and did it. And, well, at least procured the, he's going to finish it. And there's going to be a land, a new heavens, and a new earth, by which we're all going to gather. And he's going to be God with his people. But uh, that, that really contradicts very modern dispensational teaching that you hear all on the radio. Anybody on the radio that you hear around here, they teach, they're looking at Israel and like, hey, we've got to be the friends of Israel. Um, I, I'm okay with being the friends of Israel, but not because of these texts. Um, Israel isn't God's people unless they, they love Jesus. Yeah, the prophecy, I think this is where they come from, the prophecy that uh, God gives to Abraham, whoever blesses you, I'll bless, whoever curses you, I'll the curse them. Yeah, that's in Jesus. That's right. Yeah, God was speaking of the son that Abraham, in your son, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. Well, who's the son of Abraham? Jesus, Jesus is. So the blessing comes in Jesus. So bless those that are in Christ. Curse those that are. Or don't curse. You know, God's not going to curse. God's going to curse those that are. <laughs> they are cursed. So, yeah. Call Jesus the son of David. Uh, because uh, when Jesus was born from a woman, she was from the line of David. She was from, um, like, Great, great, Jesus was the great, 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 great,
He has to be born from a human, so God put a little baby in Mary's tummy. And uh, Mary was from the line of David. Interesting. We go back to um, Jacob's blessing. The son right before he died. Okay. Uh, of Judah. Part of what he said was the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor on Bobby with him between his feet until Shiloh comes. I think it's play on words on Shiloh. That's a place that he speaks. Okay. okay. And then the other one I find really interesting. Well, well let me stop right there. Right there in the in the Duke in the Genesis narrative, you you have that this eternal this eternal set, this <coughs> eternal king is gonna be in the He's going to be the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Right? He's going to be in the Lion of Judah. So uh, you have this revelation of who this this authoritative destroyer of Satan is going to be. Judah, you are he whom your brother shall praise. It's part of that. And the other interesting one is what he says to Levi. He says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Uh, instruments of cruelty are in your dwelling house. They let not my soul enter their council. They were the Pharisees. The Pharisees. Yeah. Levi. So they were blinded. They, they could not see. Jacob's were told. So you see how Jesus is the filter of the entire Old Testament. When, when, when Luke says that Jesus began in Moses and all the prophets, he revealed unto them all the scriptures concerning himself. Well, that would be a text. There, there I am. There I am. There I am. Uh, he would have gone to Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 37. These texts. All right. Just kind of hope that wasn't too heavy, too deep. I was Bible 101 with Jesus. That would be awesome. What's that? Bible 101 with Jesus. That would be awesome. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't you like to bid on that conversation? If Jesus were actually here showing us all the scriptures about the introduction to what the Bible really is. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in any class 101, I mean, like the, the basics. You're just learning. I know, but it has, but it shows you that in the front of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> you have clip notes in there. <laughs> yeah. No. I yeah. <laughs> Andrew, would you pray for us? God, thank you for your mercy that you have showed to us. You've opened our eyes and opened our hands. Not because of anything we've done, because of your goodness, Lord. Thank you that you are in control of all of this. It would be terrifying to think that we really have that much to do with it. Lord, you are sovereign. And you have your plans. And they will come about. And I thank you for that, Lord. Please be with us as we go out now, let us, let us shine your light, Lord, into, into the world as we go. And when people see our good works, they glorify you. 